Hello everyone, welcome to the Yoga Escapes in Japan podcast series. My name is Amy McCartney. Yoga Escapes in Japan is a two-year project funded by the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science and is hosted by the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies at Kyoto University, Japan. The aim of this project is to understand and document the popularity and consumption of global yoga within the Japanese cultural setting. In November 2018, we organized a two day international conference with the help of the Institute of Liberal Arts at Tashisha University and the Organization for Identity and Cultural Development. This podcast series showcases some of the presentations from the conference. Today's episode features Dr. Noemi Fudon from Kyoto University. Her presentation is on Sangati, the ethics of organizing a yoga pilgrimage to India. The difficulties which I found in organizing such a tour uh, is related to environmental questions. How does it make sense in today's uh, world to fly uh, towards India for some kind of self-development, if you can use that expression, self-development purpose? So, uh, as a world citizen, I think these are uh, questions we may uh, pose ourselves. So, I I want to uh, talk a little bit about that. Since it is based on a personal project, I will have to uh, introduce a little bit myself and my curriculum. I think it contextualizes the uh, approach and the project. Um, Also, this is a completely exploratory. Um, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone here because I'm not talking about texts or ancient texts, Sanskrit texts, the history of yoga uh, as such. And I'm a little bit inside my comfort zone because I'm talking about a personal experience. Uh, so I hope uh, I hope you will, uh, will, uh, will deal with these ideas, with this reflection. I will be able to share my reflections in a way uh, which is appropriate. And I would say at last that this uh, presentation is actually was actually a good opportunity for me, a good exercise to uh, go a little bit deeper in this reflection and to uh, really work. Uh, into these questions of uh, the conceptualization of such a trip. So I'm very happy uh, to have done that and to present this uh, in front of you. So now, a little bit uh, about my uh, curriculum. So I was uh, trained, I was trained in Lausanne University. I started uh, my uh, undergraduation with, uh, by learning Sanskrit, archaeology and ethnography. And then I continued and focused on uh, Sanskrit studies. And during my PhD, which started in 2008, uh, sorry, 2008, I uh, really started to learn about yoga philosophy. I actually uh, worked on Al Biruni. So Al Biruni was a Muslim scholar who traveled to India in the beginning of 11th century, and he, or to some places of India. And he trans- he worked an extensive he wrote an extensive work on India, and he translated some texts from uh, Sanskrit into Arabic. And my PhD work was uh, based on uh, studying his translation of a yoga and the Sankhya text. So uh, I I came to know about the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. I came to know about historical debates on uh, on yoga. And we have also seen uh, how intricate, how complicated the history of yoga is, how the terms have been used in different ways and um, so this is is an example of a debate that you learn when you are doing uh, academic studies on yoga. Another debate which uh, I think is important, just as an example, um, is the debate of the authorship of the Patanjala Yoga Shastra. Uh, Of course there are two layers of text, the Sutra and the Bhashya, and there have been uh, studies in my view, uh, demonstrating that now we have to understand it as an entity. The two layers of text uh, c- combined are uh, the Shastra. And but this, whatever we decide, whatever we agree with, I think it's just important to know this discussion. And um, now I come to the practice. This, uh, when I started practicing uh, yoga, 
two years after starting uh, my PhD, I uh, studied uh, law and yoga mostly. And it's only in 2013 that I took some uh, kind of TTC training in Switzerland, so similar to the YTT uh, that you talked about yesterday. Uh, but it was not uh, one of these class, uh, in the TTC is generally one month uh, training, intensive training in India, in an ashram in India. So what I've done was slightly different. It was an adaptation of a Swiss uh, yoga teacher who extended this training uh, for one year. So we had uh, 12 weekends in which we were learning uh, how to become a yoga teacher. So uh, during these classes, we uh, learned about um, asana, about a little bit about pedagogy, anatomy, um, pranayama, of course, and philosophy. So. <laughs> After uh, studying Indian philosophy in the University of Lausanne and having known about these debates, for example, those I mentioned uh, before, and uh, my yoga teacher, with, with, for whom I have uh, much respect, I have, uh, I mean, objectively I have nothing to complain about the classes I've taken, but uh, when, I, when you come from this background, I think you have to uh, make a lot of efforts to let it go, whatever you have to learn. <laughs> 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 and to take it from a different perspective. So, so that's just to, um, to illustrate, it, illustrate uh, the contradiction between theory and practice and at the same time to show a little bit uh, uh, from where I come. Uh, then about the project. So um, I'm co-organizing this project with uh, Malek Daouk. So Malek Daouk, uh, first I want to say I did not meet him in a yoga context. I met him, uh, I knew his son, and Malek was interested in Al-Biruni, so that's how we met, and we uh, started to uh, engage in discussion. And Malek uh, has visited India in his 90s. He has met uh, Krishna Macharya, and he, started, he stayed there, uh, so that means 40, 50 years back. He stayed in India for several years, and he learned about yoga and Ayurveda. In uh, 1979, he founded a uh, yoga school in Lausanne, I mean, a school teaching yoga and Ayurveda, uh, which is called Sangati, hence the title of uh, the talk today, Sangati. Um, so he, yeah, his school is uh, well established, he is offering uh, yoga classes, but he's also offering a four years uh, yoga teacher training. And he's focused on uh, yoga therapy also. I mean, he has a strong, um, he has the two aspects. He wants to teach or to speak about the two aspects, yoga and Ayurveda. Now, uh, he, he was also a student of Johannes Bronkost uh, in the University of Lausanne. I mean, as till the master level, I would say. So he has also some background in Sanskrit. Uh, now with whom we are going to go, uh, with a group of yoga practitioners, but not only, and um, and me. And uh, Malek actually proposed me to do that in 2017, uh, where he, during this tour, he would uh, do the yoga practice, and I would uh, somehow uh, give conferences or talks uh, when we visit sites. So uh, why? Uh, why we are doing uh, this tour. So I asked Malek wh what are the reasons him uh, to do the, the, the tour. So he told me that in 1994 he, uh, he had his first uh, yoga pilgrimage with students uh, in South India where he met his teachers, uh, Krishna Macharya. So he wanted his students to, met, to meet his, his teachers. Uh, for him it was a quest of spirituality, uh, to an opportunity to have an intense practice, to visit temples, and also to give some classes on Ayurveda. So that's what uh, Manet told me when I asked him why he started to organize this pilgrimage. Uh, he also told me that uh, his idea was to share his knowledge and see his students grow inside. And uh, now, why I'm uh, willing to do this uh, pilgrimage? So I've never thought about that before he, he uh, proposed me this. And after, or maybe I, maybe I, I want to introduce uh, something. During my uh, first years of PhD, I became aware of the concept of uh, public intellectual. 
also, of course, uh, through the figures of uh, Romina Tapar, uh, Slavoj uh, Tizek, or Noam Chomsky. And it led me to ask uh, me a question which was actually since long time in my mind, what do we do with our, with our knowledge? And uh, I was inspired actually by the idea of public intellectuality. Uh, in the sense that I, I believe uh, that we have some kind of responsibility to also uh, diffuse or, or um, share what we learn, what we are educated for. It's uh, maybe not only for us. Uh, of course, I'm not a political uh, activist. Uh, I mean, not yet at least. <laughs> but uh, my idea of public intellectual would be rather uh, diplomatic and sharing uh, the knowledge. And I have already done that. Uh, by uh, realizing two uh, documentary movies, one on Al-Biruni. Uh, and we realized while screening this movie that many people did not know about, uh, of course, Al-Biruni, but also the Islamic uh, Golden Age, uh, which occurred uh, during that time in Central Asia, which I think is important to share, uh, also considering the, the, the today's context of Islamophobia. And we realized another uh, movie, uh, which is the title Political, which explains how uh, they instrumentalized uh, or they instrumentalized uh, cow in India I mean, politically. And we realized by screening this movie that many people also uh, don't know about that. And that's really informative uh, to them. So I realized that maybe that's one reason why I would like to uh, do this tour. Uh, now and, uh, and yeah, and how this is to symbolize some cliché about India. So the idea is to deconstruct this cliché. Uh, I'm not going to explain what, what can be done because again we, we talked about that already. So yeah, to to, to make aware uh, people of a different kind of uh, India maybe. And then the, the second step uh, during uh, the preparation of this presentation was, was to ask myself uh, environmental question. So I interviewed uh, two young Indians which were uh, involved in, uh, in tourism and environment in the uh, Himalayas. And one of them is Arshik. He's a trekker, explorer of the Himalayas and co-founder co and director of Trekmont, which is a trekking company um, with a focus, strong focus of raising awareness and educating people on how to travel, how to trek, and not only in terms of environment, but also in terms of preparation when you go a high altitude like that, how do you do to survive so, somehow. So a few points, I will just sum up the interview I had with him uh, here, and highlight a few points which I liked, or which I found, which I felt uh, relevant. So he said something, in Ladakh, in contrast uh, to other place, uh, tourists reach the destination before the awareness. So what he meant by that uh, was that uh, in a place like uh, Meghalaya, for example, they have the facilities for tourists, for mass tourist tourism. But uh, this is lacking in, the, in uh, Ladakh. It is lacking in uh, Uttarakhand. And this is a problem because tourists are not prepared before going, or they are not uh, sensitized about the specific problems uh, which uh, are there. Um, and another point which he made was the easy access, the quick access to uh, this place. For example, he, he, he explained to me that uh, originally Ladakh was popular for uh, bikers, uh, like many years back, maybe 30 years back, and they had it was not easy to reach there. They had to prepare their trip. They had to know how to travel, how to uh, reach the place. So they, they, it, it, it demanded a whole work of preparation, which brought somehow a kind of awareness. But now it's not like that. Now you have uh, planes. It's very easy. It's very quick. And it becomes a little bit like a product, rather than a spiritual uh, pilgrimage or spiritual uh, uh, path. And, yeah. It reminded me actually when you uh, mentioned that the, the lava studio, to the studio are all located near uh, a station, a subway station, the, the, yeah, the ease of consumption. Mm -hmm. So, but this leads of lack of awareness in the case of uh, Ladakh. 
And for example, he uh, told me that in, uh, in the summer, during three months, they have been in the Lutkund uh, Trail, which is a very popular uh, trekking trail, apparently. And they have collected during three months 7,000 to 8,000 8, kg of plastic waste. Mm -hmm. And he also mentioned the fact that the facilities uh, are not there in Uttarakhand and Ladakh to, uh, to handle this uh, garbage. And they had to bring it back till they are doing. So they are doing this kind of work of undo the damage. And this uh, company, Trekman, is also uh, organizing a workshop uh, which are uh, given in Delhi, for example. So people, before going to Ladakh, uh, they will take uh, this workshop in Delhi. And in, during these uh, workshops, Arshid told me, they would try to educate people about the differences, <coughs> how people live different in Ladakh, in terms of environment and society, and again, to bring awareness. So this is uh, the results of my interview with Arshid. Another uh, person whom I interviewed is Gorab, who is a researcher in env environmental studies. He also uh, tracked a lot in the, in the Himalayas and he worked for uh, several months now in Ladakh. So he was uh, telling me that Ladakh is an ecologically fragile uh, ecosystem because it's high altitude uh, cold desert because there is, I mean, and because of that there is less flora and fauna. The water bodies uh, are coming from glacier. And nowadays, with the tourism, almost, I mean, Ladakh is still not a place with mass tourism, but it's a hub of tourism now in, in Lake. Um, so they are building ro roads and uh, high star five five stars hotel in a very uh, uh, how to say hurried way. Mm -hmm. And all these actually give an, an excessive stress on the natural resources of Ladakh, which is ecologically fragile. Of, of course, maybe I don't. Uh, teach you anything here, but I thought these points are particularly interesting to highlight in this discussion. Uh, now he gave me an example, Pangang Lake. I don't know if you know that place, but it's a very uh, famously touristic uh, spot in Ladakh. I mean, everybody uh, will go there, they will tell you, ah, did you go to Pangang Lake? That's the must to, to be, to see. So recently they have banned it. Why? Because uh, it is a, so Pangang Lake is the lake, and uh, Trek is the, the distance between Arle and uh, Pangong Lake. So this lake is, uh, according to Gorab, um, uh, a reserve for migratory birds, and they have uh, put numerous settlements there due to tourism. So this again, because of tourism, you have uh, you have litters, garbage, and this is a, tree, a safe street to breeding uh, migratory birds in a place which is already uh, ecologically fragile. So they have banned. The government actually have now, now you cannot stay uh, near the bank of the Pangong Lake. You can stay a little bit far from it. You can still go. So this is a good thing. And there are still things which are uh, happening. So um, after all this, uh, I asked myself, uh, why do we travel? So of course, uh, there are uh, different reasons in history. Uh, people travel for trade, for military conquests. Uh, but of course, uh, for religious purpose, for adventure, and uh, something which, I mean, a religious purpose would be uh, maybe uh, the, the, the pilgrimage type of uh, traveling. Yeah. And I realized that there is also, uh, so the pilgrimage which would have this, uh, when we travel in pilgrimage, maybe we have this expectation that we are growing inside, we have a special kind of attitude to the place we visit, uh, and a an personal experience uh, of learning. So that would be general ideas connected to a pilgrimage, or some of them at least. And another thing which came to my mind is uh, maybe an intellectual purpose, or rather a learning things, learning how uh, the other lives. Um, and um, yeah, and this is uh, seen in Europe at least, or in Switzerland at least, uh, there is a very good connotation of traveling and learning, and uh, the, the connection between traveling and learning. You have uh, sayings like, traveling broadens the mind, or uh, traveling is learning, and this is very popular in Switzerland at least. 
And I realized also that uh, some other examples are there to show how traveling is connected to the learning beside a pure religious experience, experience but also personal intellectual learning and, and how um, you being with the other, you uh, experiencing the other, uh, you, you learn through that. So there are other examples from the Swiss uh, context which show this positive connotation, and I mentioned a few uh, of them. One of them is Ella Mayar, so I have no idea if you know her, but she was an explorer, traveler in the beginning of the 20th century. She had traveled to Kabul, to, uh, to India, to Nepal, and she uh, has written about that. She is a prolific uh, writer, and she is one of the popular, I mean, there are very rare, very less uh, famous writers in Switzerland, but she is one of them. And another person is Nicolas Pouvier. So he traveled in the 50s to the east also, to Kabul, to uh, Sri Lanka, but also to Japan. And he has done the same kind of stuff. I mean, traveling by road, taking pictures, writing about his uh, traveling and uh, sh sharing his experience. And another figure which is more, who is more recent is uh, Gael Metro. He, so he's uh, my age, approximately. And he, he came, at, at, in the, um, at first he came on the footstep of Nicolas Bouvier to do a movie. And second, and, and this led to a di totally different kind of uh, trip and movie. And the second trip he did it was uh, towards uh, Pakistan and India, where he uh, realized two, two documentary movies. And what I, mean, what I mean by showing that is that these two people have, uh, are popular, and they have uh, some kind of reputation. They, they bring something to the collective uh, feeling or uh, memory, maybe. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why uh, People image of traveling is also popular, and I don't think uh, we can take it out from the society uh, of the people who are actually traveling. And in Switzerland, I know this, these are figures. I mean, even those people who don't read, they know about them, and they, they have some kind of uh, imagination about uh, what, what to, uh, how to travel to the east and exploring. And, doing one's own experience as an initiatory uh, trip, intellectually or religiously. But, uh, these trips are not quick. Uh, it's not uh, traveling quickly uh, through flight from one place to another, so of course it's different. And, and they had time to grow, they had time to meet the difference before reaching the destination, if even the, reaching the, definition, the destination was important. They had they had to learn how to deal with people they met uh, during the trip. Nowadays, you travel uh, by flight, you travel to Delhi, and then to Delhi, uh, from Delhi to Leh. You have no time to do this kind of contact and to actually understand the difference and uh, raise your awareness before you, you reach the destination. So, so, and then in that sense, they were also uh, less a product than uh, what we have now in the pilgrimage. So I now finally come to the, the plan of the trip. So that's the plan how we uh, have it now. Um, so the idea um, for me at first was to break uh, stereotypes, as I said. So we would visit uh, some part of Delhi, mostly uh, sites of Islamic period, so that I can talk about that, I can talk about the history of Islam in India. Uh, then to Varanasi, where we may focus on Indian or Hindu sites, where I would talk about Hindu history, but also then maybe uh, talking about the, some basic concepts, uh, castes, uh, what is the exact meaning of karma, maybe some ideas about the self, if I can. Uh, and then to Sarnath, uh, where I would uh, take the opportunity to talk about Buddhism. Of course, this is not exhaustive, and I not, uh, I'm not uh, telling I will do, I can do everything in such a short trip. But I would take it as uh, some kind of introductory classes, maybe, and uh, also uh, popularize them, vulgarize them, probably. So this is the, this was the general idea, and I had it workshop, which is the workshop uh, which we will take with Trek Monk before going to Ladakh. 
because I, I want to be sure we have this training. So that was the basic idea when we started to uh, plan it that actually we would highlight the different uh, histories of India. As I say, as against uh, cliché about India, Gandhi, Om, Yoga, etc. So talking about the three main religions, talking about uh, some aspects of history. I mean, I don't have the details now. I will start uh, developing uh, the talks. When, I will, but when we will be sure this is happening, because we still are waiting for a uh, confirmation of people. Mm -hmm. voilà. uh, now, about the, so that was the historical part, it was pretty much sure that we would do like that. But now, after doing this small research about the environmental part, so that was the idea. We would go to Leh, then for two days we'll be to Nugra Valley, thank you, and we will uh, visit Leh, and then for two days again we will go on a trek. So rather quick, and uh, how does it fit into the environmental uh, questions I had uh, exposed uh, before? I think it does not fit too much because we are quickly moving to another place with cars, and so I will try to revise it uh, in the sense that it can uh, fit a little bit more uh, into the problems which were raised by Arshit or Gaurav, and this thanks to this uh, talk that I'm really able to, to, to do it. Um, and there is an the last aspect, which, uh, so there are two, uh, two first aspects, the historical and cultural aspect, or the dimension, which I want to put in this clip, and environmental dimension. Now there is a third one, so this is also mostly in my mind, and I could not share it much with uh, Malek yet, but the idea is to uh, encourage uh, exchanges between us and uh, local people, I would say. So that means maybe uh, meeting monks, uh, staying in monasteries, staying in homestead, uh, meeting uh, priests. So of course there is a problem of language, there are many issues. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because the, the first time I came to South Asia, it was in Nepal, and we were doing an ethno-archaeological study. And we had to interview people. We had to go um, to the people and ask them, OK, what is this? Uh, what do you believe with that? So, and that's how I think you can really get the, some honest com com uh, contacts. And that's where you can really bridge some gaps between our imaging, the, imagine the construction of the India and the, the reality. So I'm thinking of how to implement that, if I can uh, maybe uh, tell them that we have a research question uh, in the beginning of the day, and maybe they are uh, they, they are willing to uh, to uh, to get a little bit uh, involved with uh, people. I mean, let's see, that's still um, in construction, but that's an idea. I saw to encourage real uh, real exchanges actually. So that's more or less uh, all. So as you see, as you saw, uh, yeah, maybe the last, ah, yeah, so the promotion. So actually, our promotion is not very developed. <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine, we are not business-oriented. Uh, so let's see if we are not expecting uh, so many people. But now I'm willing to make a small text, actually, which explains a little bit the idea of the trip uh, based more or less of, on what I presented today. And now the last image. So I represented this, this red ribbon by um, present awareness and travel. So I think both of them can uh, be balanced. And that's what I actually uh, want to do in such kind of trips. Hopefully it happens. And uh, so as you say, as you understood, it's not just a yoga pilgrimage. It's a whole package. But, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the idea. And uh, let's see if it works. But anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Stay tuned for more episodes. In the meantime, please have a look at the Yoga Scapes in Japan website at yogascapesinjapan.com. Also, if you're feeling generous, please think about making a donation through the GoFundMe account linked to the website. Until next time. <laughs>